Good morning, everybody. Uh, before we get started, JD, just want to make sure we can hear you and you can hear us. I've got you loud and clear, Jeff. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, we're pleased to be uh, welcomed today by Colonel John Dorian, the spokesperson for Operation Inherit Resolve, coming to us live from uh, Baghdad. Uh, JD, we'll turn it over to you for uh, any opening comments you have. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, all. Today we'll start in Syria and we'll move on to Iraq. In Syria, significant progress is being made in liberating previously held Daesh territory. In the past week, coalition conducted more than 60 kinetic strikes against ISIL fighters, leaders, and infrastructure to support the Syrian Democratic Forces operations to isolate Raqqa along two converging axes of advance. The SDF has liberated 270 square kilometers, 321 since the beginning of the operation. As you know, Daesh can consider Raqqa their capital in Syria, so we expect resistance to stiffen as forces move closer to the city. Of note, coalition forces conducted a strike resulting in the death of Iraqi national Ab Abdel Basit al-Iraqi, who was emir of ISIL's Middle East external networks, including against American, Turkish, and European targets. Abdel Basit was struck and killed November 12th in Raqqa, Syria. He was a key facilitator for ISIL's external operations routes through Turkey and was responsible for attacks within the Middle East. Along with these external attacks and plots, he's also been connected to convoy reconnaissance and facilitation extremist travel, uh, finances, and weapons in the region. His death degrades and delays ISIL's current plots against regional targets and deprives them of capable senior manager who provided oversight over many external attacks. In Iraq, Iraqi security forces continue making progress in clearing areas of Daesh presence in Mosul and have seen fierce resistance that they had planned for and that we've been talking about for months. This is a neighborhood to neighborhood fighting, particularly in the east, and the Iraqi security forces have moved deliberately and exercised a laudable level of restraint in an effort to protect civilian life. Daesh have done the opposite, taking human shields, dressing as ISF and arresting people who react positively to their presence, arresting civilians for having phones and using tunnels to infiltrate c civilian neighborhoods. This is extremely tough fighting, but the ISF have continued their advance, liberating Nimrud this past week after initial tough fighting, followed by Daesh retreating toward Mosul. As many of you know, the enemy destroyed a lot of ancient architecture at Nimrud and then sold artifacts on the black market in order to finance their operations. This is another in the string of atrocities conducted by Daesh, and the evidence of these events mounts as they continue to lose territory. Finally, I'd like to show a video taken near Tel Afar. Jeff, if you could uh, roll that video. Uh, coalition Air... a photo. Uh, JD, uh, uh, if we could ask you to go back. We, we lost you when we switched to the video. Could we ask you to tell us about the video again? And then uh, we, we do now have the photo up. You can talk to the photo as well. Good. Okay. Well, the, uh, the video that you're seeing is uh, of a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device factory near Tel Afar. As you can see, there are some pretty significant secondary explosions as that's taken out from an airstrike. Next, uh, tell us about the photo we see. You'll have to let me know once the video is done, Jeff. We're ready to talk about that cool photo. The photo that you're looking at is a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device that was captured captured in Peshmerga territory, and it's now used uh, to train Peshmerga forces at one of our training sites in northern Iraq. As you can see, it's reminiscent of a Mad Max vehicle with 
armored plating in the front to protect the driver until he can detonate the explosives he's carrying on board. The coalition has used strikes mostly from the air to destroy these anywhere that they can be found. Around Mosul, we've destroyed 60 plus since the Iraqi forces commenced their operation to liberate the city on October 17th. And I'm sure you recall that we destroyed hundreds of these during the shaping operations in the months that leading up to the Mosul operation. Okay, so now I'll be delighted to take your questions. We'll start with uh, Lita Baldor from the Associated Press. Thanks, John. Um, can you, uh, Turkey has uh, today been talking about how close they are in getting into Al Bab. Can you give us a sense of are they within a couple kilometers of getting in? What kind of resistance uh, are you hearing that they're meeting? And uh, and I have a second uh, follow up. Sure. Uh, they are very close. The last I heard, they were within a couple of kilometers. I just checked in with uh, our op center. Uh, they've not yet uh, moved into Al Bab and taken the city, but uh, they are very, very close. Encountering some pretty tough resistance, they do expect to be able to power through that. And secondly, um, we keep hearing about this effort and need to train up more Syrian Arab fighters. Can you give us an update on how that's going? Uh, how many are coming in? How many do you have trained up now? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, uh, the, the number that we have, I, I don't have an updated number on that. I can tell you that uh, our partners are very keen to increase the size of the force, particularly of Syrian Arabs uh, from the, the local area there. We'll have to owe you an update on the numbers that, uh, that they're getting. But do you have any sense as to whether or not the effort is actually moving? Are, is there an increase at all, do you know? Yeah, I just don't have any figures for you, uh, Lita. I, I don't know. I'll have to check in on that and, and owe you that answer. Uh, one thing I would say, though, is we do expect it to, this isolation phase uh, to go on for a number of weeks, uh, perhaps months even, and it's going to be a deliberate approach. Uh, so, you know, there's plenty of time uh, for our partners to work this issue. Uh, Tom Bowman from National Public Radio. Hey, Colonel, I want to stay in El Bob for a second. There were a lot of people here in Washington who were concerned about the Turks moving on El Bob, you know, basically cutting off the two uh, Kurdish enclaves, and maybe in Syria, you know, uh, made some comments about maybe we'll attack the Turks if they head to El Bob. Just give us your sense from the command over there. Is this a good thing or a bad thing that the Turks are heading to El Bob? And will it, uh, you know, have problems with the Kurdish forces uh, heading uh, toward Raqqa, they'll be looking over their shoulder. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a situation where Turkey, with their partnered force, have made the, the decision that they're going to take Al Bab. Uh, it's a very complicated battlefield with a lot of actors uh, with sometimes competing interests. So um, certainly we're not going to uh, wish that uh, any area of northern Syria remain in dash hands, but we have been uh, in the, uh, working an ongoing dialogue with Turkey and with our partners and with other coalition members to try and make sure that we deconflict all of our operations because uh, we don't want there to be problems uh, such as you described. Well, is the command supportive of this Turkish move into El Bab? Is it a good thing? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, what, I would, uh, what I would say about that is the coalition has not been a part of the, the, uh, the Turkish advance toward Al Bab. Uh, this is a national decision that they made. What we are uh, definitely uh, um, positive about is that everybody here, uh, Turkey and us uh, and our partners on the ground and the partnered force that's working with Turkey all have a vested interest in defeating Daesh and this is something that there will be ongoing political discussions about. So it's really not for me to characterize that at this point. 
so that the Turkish troops will move deeper into Syria after the Al Bab operation? Well, that's a decision that they'll make, and it'll be one, again, that'll be the focus of ongoing political discussion. Uh, the coalition uh, continues to work with the, our partners, the Syrian Democratic Forces, and their uh, contingent of Syrian Arabs to isolate Raqqa, and then we'll continue the political dialogue with Turkey and our partners uh, and, and our allies uh, on the way forward from there. Lou, uh, Courtney Cuby from NBC News. Hey, J.D., just one more on El Bab. So when you're saying political, there's political discussion, you're saying that there's no military to, I guess, the coalition or U.S. military to Turkish military discussions encouraging them to, you know, continue to go after ISIS but leave the YPG alone and maybe not move towards Al Bab. There's no mill to mill discussion going on about that. Well there there are daily mill to mill discussions between the coalition and Turkey because Turkey is a part of the international coalition to defeat Daesh. As far as the deconfliction effort, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So what we want to do is keep everybody focused on defeating Daesh, make sure there are clear lanes in the road for all of our partners uh, to make sure that there's no miscalculation or misunderstanding or uh, where we end up uh, with a situation that uh, complicates matters rather than facilitating Daesh's defeat. And this, the Turkish move towards Al Bab, you haven't seen that slowing down the SDF move to towards south towards Raqqa? That's not having any impact on the movement with the YPG component of the SDF? Well, the SDF has continued their operations along two axes of advance. Uh, and what we expect is that once those axes converge, they'll back clear some of the area behind that. This is a significant pocket with a lot of dash presence, uh, and this has been their plan. It's, uh, it's going according to their plan and along the timeline that uh, they expected to do. And then could you just tell us a little bit more about the guy, I, I, sorry, I didn't get his name. Was it Abdel Baka, I think, who you mentioned was killed on the 12th? Like how, um, it was a U.S. was a U.S. airstrike. What was the platform? And um, when you talk about some of his external attack plots, can you give us some specifics about things he might have been involved in either planning or actually executing? No, you know what, Courtney, I just don't really have that level of detail to provide. So uh, we can take those questions and follow up with you afterward. Cool. Thank you. Uh, next we'll go to uh, Kasim Larry with Anadolu. Yeah. Colin, thanks for doing this. Uh, my question would be about a controversial tweet by Presidential Envo Envoy Ambassador McGurk, who said that YPG elements are still in Mambich to terrain the local fighters, and these guys are going to leave the part members and cross the east of Euratis after local units complete training, McGurk said. I have asked this question maybe 100 times mm -hmm. from different platforms to you, to all other uh, officials, and they uh, categorically denied that any YPG elements are in the city. They have left, they have crossed the city, and even Pentagon made an announcement that's saying that they appreciate that the YPG elements or SDF elements crossed back to the east of the city. And now we hear the presidential envoy saying that these guys are there to train local forces. Could you square this circle for me, please? What does, what does this tell us about all you have been saying from the very beginning? Mm-hmm. Well, what we had been seeing from the beginning is that uh, the, the uh, YPG had largely left and that the leadership elements were gone. Uh, they did leave some people in place to train uh, the Manbij Military Council so that Daesh can't re-infiltrate and take the city that uh, so many had fought so hard uh, to take. So that's what was happening there. and. Uh, I can verify for you that the, uh, the YPG elements have indeed moved out of uh, Manbij. So, so you say that no YPG elements are still in Manbij?
That's right. And and McGurk says they are there, they will depart after they complete the, the training of these local forces first. And secondly, this is the first time that I hear from you saying that the leadership has left <coughs> while some forces, some part of the forces are going to remain inside city to train the local the Membich Military Council. This is the first time, frankly, that I hear this and it's today that you are saying it. So you 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 say that now they have they have they have trained, they completed and they have left. Is that what you say? So do you deny what McGurk has said? No, I'm I'm verifying what Special Envoy McGurk said. So he says they will depart when they complete training, and you say they have left. Yeah, that, that's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Okay. This may have been yeah. by Curtis uh, Dan 24. Right. Lori Milroy, Curtis Dan 24. The uh, Shiite militias, the Hashta Shabi, are, are now moving on Tel Afar. They're very close to it. How do you see that offensive going, and are you concerned about their committing human rights violations against the Sunnis and the Sunni areas that they, they'll move into? Well, what, uh, what we know about the, uh, the popular mobilization forces uh, is that they've moved uh, out uh, southwest of Tel Afar. They're not in the city. They're very close to it. Uh, and that move is intended to uh, block any egress area for Daesh who are in Mosul. Uh, it'll block them so that they won't be able to move westward as the pressure inside Mosul increases. So that's the Iraqi plan. Uh, that's uh, what's been briefed to us, and that's what we've observed on the battlefield thus far. Into Tel Afar once they're on the edge of the city? I heard you said something on the edge of the city. I didn't hear the first part of your question. I Once they get to the edge of Tel Afar, they're very close to it, as you have said, will they move into the city itself? Well, what, I've, what I have heard is that uh, the plan is for them to uh, stay outside the city and that the Iraqi army... Uh, will indeed be the force that goes into Tel Afar um, and that they'll remain in their blocking positions. That's, that's what I've seen uh, of the plan, and thus far that's what's happened. And if I could ask you about the um, SDF, you mentioned there were two axes of advance that were going to converge. This is advance on Raqqa? Yeah, that's correct. It's, uh, it's advancing toward Raqqa, and then they'll converge uh, and then back clear the pocket that they created with their advance. So um, they're moving toward Raqqa, uh, and then they'll back clear the area that they create on the two axes of advance. How do you assess their progress so far? Well, they're on plan. We've uh, dropped about 250 munitions to support their operations, and these are against dash targets, uh, vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, fighting positions, their fighters. So uh, they've been successful, and they've been able to move uh, in the direction that they intended to. Uh, they've met moderate resistance along the way, but they've been able to execute their plan. Uh, next, we'll go to Laurent Bartholomew with the Conference. Hi, Colonel. Thank you for doing this. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand uh, the position of the of the coalition towards the Turkish offensive on Al Bab. Are, are you saying that uh, the coalition will not do any airstrikes, for instance, to to support the Turkish forces' effort? Well.
Well, what I'm, what I'm telling you is we've not supported uh, the advance to El Bab thus far. Uh, we did conduct a lot of strikes in support uh, of, uh, of the Turkish uh, military and their partnered force as they conducted operations to clear Daesh along their border. So this is a decision they've made to go into Al Bab, um, but it's not one that uh, the coalition has provided strikes in support of. Can you explain why the, the coalition has taken this position? Well, we believe that all the operations in uh, Syria uh, against Daesh should be coordinated very closely between all the parties that are involved. Um, this is a, a something that they've decided to do independently. And what we'd like to do is to continue to work with them to develop a plan where everyone remains focused on Daesh. We have good deconfliction measures in place, uh, and we don't have any uh, chance uh, of partners that both have an interest in defeating Daesh converging in a way that would be unhelpful. Okay, uh, next we'll go to uh, Ryan Brown of CNN. Hello, Colonel. Thank you for doing this. Um, just a question on Mosul. Um, so is it, have U.S. advisors entered the city uh, as the CTS kind of makes progress going neighborhood by neighborhood? Have they at any point entered the city and maybe have left or are in the city now? Could you could you talk a little bit about whether or not uh, U.S. personnel or coalition personnel have actually breached the city limits? Well, um, what I would say about that is that uh, the uh, uh, Iraqi forces have gotten about a third of the way into eastern Mosul. That's a very small area, and we're not going to comment on the position of our U.S or coalition advisors in relation to those forces. Um, they remain behind the forward line of troops. They're there in an advisory role. And one of the things that's very important to understand here is that the co it's not the role of the coalition to close on the enemy uh, and try to take that terrain. That's a job for the Iraqi security forces. And that's a, an enduring theme. So we're not going to get into the exact position of uh, U.S. or coalition forces in Mosul. That's not something we're going to do. Okay, and I, I just want to have a follow-up on al-Bab. Just, just a point of clarity. So currently ISIS is in control of al-Bab. Is that correct? That is correct. Not for long, probably. That's, that's it. good to know. Uh, and so I'm just, I guess, following up on Laurent's question about, you know, the decision not to conduct airstrikes against ISIS in Al Bab in, in support of the, of the Turkish incursion. Is that, I mean, it, that seems to be a, a signal that there's, there's, you know, it seems to be a pretty strong signal to a, a member of the coalition that what they're doing is, is not appropriate. Well, it's a signal that there needs to be some continued ongoing diplomatic discussions about the manner in which uh, we continue to fight Daesh in northern Syria. That's been something that we've talked about for quite some time. Uh, beyond that, I really don't have any detail to provide about that. Yes, sir. All right, uh, next we'll go with Toga Tanis from Hurriyet. Uh, hi, Colonel. Uh, a quick question on al -Bab to clarify something. Uh, you were supporting Turkish forces in clearing this border area uh, since the Jarabus operation <coughs> after one week or ten days after the Jarabus operation. When did you stop to support this advance? I mean, is there any limit, for example, uh, from the Turkish border, 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers, something like that? Mm -hmm. You know what, I'm not going to get into the, the uh, coordination process that we have with uh, Turkey. Uh, that's something that we do between us and, and our ally. Um, I, I, I understand why you're asking, but it is a matter of operational security. That's just not something we're going to get into. Can you give us a, a timeline? I mean, when was the last time that you supported this advance? One week ago or two weeks ago? When did you stop this support to the Turkish advance in the area? Well, 
Well, we, we've, uh, we've continued to provide air support for Turkey uh, in a variety of locations across northern Syria. As far as uh, when we uh, stopped supporting it, uh, I'm not going to get into the details. Did conflict this advance with you? They are conducting airstrikes in the area. Did they conflict this with you? Uh, I couldn't hear what you said. Did military did did they conflict? Did con they conflict these airstrikes that they are conducting in the area with the situation? Uh, I would have to check on that. I know we have a lot of ongoing dialogue uh, with Turkey about airstrikes and, and deconflicting those and making sure we maintain safety of flight, but uh, I don't know the answer to that. We'll take that question and get back with you. Last one, Colonel. Uh, do you have any communication channels with the Afrin Kurds who are also advancing to Elbat, and are you concerned any clash between Afrin Kurds and the Turkish military in the area? Mm -hmm. I'll have to take that question as well. Thanks. And next we'll go to Joe Tabbitt. Thank, uh, Thank you, J.D. Uh, in regards to the operation to isolate uh, Raqqa, could you give us a sense about the size of the YPG who are involved in the operation? And also, could you confirm that British and American special forces are with the YPG on the ground? Well, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to confirm uh, the location of coalition forces in Syria. We've not done that, uh, and we're not going to get into that business now. Um, the size of the force is also something that, just detail-wise, it'd be really inappropriate for me to get into that level of detail. So, um, you know, it's a fraction of their overall force. Uh, in order to isolate Raqqa, it, it doesn't require all their forces, and indeed. It's important that uh, they re have remaining forces in areas that have been taken from Daesh control elsewhere uh, so that Daesh is unable to re-infiltrate those areas. Uh, but they do have adequate forces to continue their advance and to continue the isolation effort. Uh, quick follow-up. What about Turkey in regards to the Raqqa operation? Do you know if Turkey will, have, will play any role in, in that operation? This is an area where uh, the chairman uh, and uh, our leadership have been very clear that uh, we're still working out the details for the, the, uh, the overall effort, and there will be an ongoing uh, diplomatic effort with Turkey and with our partners and with the coalition uh, to determine what roles and how we might do this in the most productive and effective possible way. So uh, I don't have any details on where we are with all that. That's in a diplomatic channel. Uh, and so, really, it has yet to be determined what role Turkey might have. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we'll go to Louis Martinez with ABC News. Okay, John, um, question about uh, al -Bab. Don't, don't um, Aren't the U.S. advisors accompanying uh, Turkish-supported uh, um, rebels' forces or Turkish forces? I mean, I think that was happening at some point. Is that still continuing, and are they involved in the support of the uh, al-Bab operation? Uh, that, that was, we did have uh, forces partnered uh, with Turkey and their partnered forces for quite some time through uh, a lot of the operations in northern Syria. They're, they are not a part of the advance on al-Bab. Does that mean that they were removed? Um, after that advance on al Bab began? That's, yes. Can I ask you a question about Mosul, please? Um, how, you're talking about the, uh, the, the tough fight uh, between, um, in the eastern part of Mosul. Uh, how, how is that complicating the presence of civilians um, in that battle space. How is that complicating the potential for airstrikes 
uh, there to the support of the ISF. And can you describe the efforts to prevent civilian casualties on that battle space? Any time that you have uh, dense urban warfare like you see in Mosul, uh, it's a very challenging situation, but we do have the capability to strike enemy targets. Uh, what that does is it influences the manner in which we conduct our strikes. Now, we continue to use our intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, our eyes in the sky, uh, in order to verify targets, and we continue to coordinate those uh, with the Iraqis, both in our operation centers and on the ground. Uh, and we also think about things like the size of the weapons that we use. Now, uh, the, the Air Force and, and our, uh, uh, all of our coalition forces have 2,000-pound bombs. We also have small diameter bombs, 250 pounds. And so we might uh, influence the types of choices that we make with regard to what weapons are used. We are following the Iraqi lead. They've shown a considerable amount of restraint with the manner in which they've advanced into the city. They've tried very hard to protect civilians. We see some of the open source reports with Iraqi security forces sharing their rations, sharing their medical supplies with civilians. That's a pretty laudable effort. We think it's uh, something that all Iraqis ought to be proud of, uh, and we're going to follow suit with that. But make no mistake, we will take every opportunity that we can to remove capabilities that Dash would use on the battlefield in order to create danger. We'll take every opportunity to do that. Can I ask you one last question about this Mad Max vehicle you described here? You said it's, a, it's now uh, being used for training. Um, is there a standardized kind of concept for how these vehicles are created? And, and what kind of... Uh, Training is it involved with? The, what, what are the pers what are the PESH doing with this uh, vehicle? Mm -hmm. Well, as far as uh, you know, that vehicle that is a captured vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. So it was stopped with 50 caliber weapons fire. Uh, as you can see, the the uh, the front of it has uh, a significant amount of armored plating, and what that does is it protects the driver so he can maneuver. Uh, the VBIED into position and then detonate uh, the explosives that are in there. So as, the, the, uh, as we conduct our training, and this is something that's been going on for some months uh, with the Peshmerga and with the Iraqi security forces, we knew that they were going to go into a dense uh, urban type fight in order to take Mosul. Uh, and so they use this capability and uh, teach the uh, forces how to react to that threat uh, and don the appropriate weapon uh, so that they can stop those. Thank you. All right, uh, next we'll uh, go to Lucas Tomlinson with Fox News. Colonel, just to follow up on Ryan's question, can you rule out that U.S. forces are inside Mosul? Uh, no, I cannot. We, we're not going to verify the location of uh, U.S. or coalition forces in Mosul. That's, uh, that would just be inappropriate to do that. Uh, we do remain behind the forward line of troops. It's not our role uh, to take terrain or close with the enemy. They're there as advisors. Uh, as the Iraqis move, if they need us, uh, we'll go where they need us. How important are those U.S. advisors to this fight? Well, there's no question that uh, U.S. advisors are in harm's way. Uh, we do advise the CTS. Uh, they are in the thick of a very tough battle, so uh, there is a significant amount of danger here, especially on the eastern axis as they moved into the city. They've moved through some very tough resistance as they've approached the city. Uh, our advisors are close by, uh, so the enemy does get a vote, but our, our, uh, our forces are not really... Uh, going to be trifled with, they will most certainly defend themselves, and they are there strictly to uh, advise and assist the Iraqi security forces, and in this case, the CTS. How many more months will this Mosul operation take? As 
very difficult to predict how long it's going to take as all the Iraqi security forces converge on the city and the Iraqis continue to maneuver through there and we continue to conduct our strikes. We've conducted more than 4,000 so far, uh, dropping, uh, dropping bombs on uh, dash targets and that's killed hundreds of their fighters. It's removed hundreds of their fighting positions and weapons. Uh, we've taken out more than 80 tunnels taken out more than 60 vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, eventually the enemy is going to break. Uh, it's going to take quite some time, and what they've done, all these th tactics that they've used to increase danger for the civilians there, what that means is it's going to be a very deliberate fight, very dangerous fight for the forces that are advancing there, uh, but we'll continue striking the enemy until ultimately uh, the Iraqis are going to take that city, and that is, as you know, uh, the Daesh capital in Iraq. Uh, it's going to be taken from them, and then they'll be back to just being a garden variety terrorist group. And uh, the Iraqis will be in mop-up duty then. And lastly, how tenacious is ISIS in this fight? Well, I, you know, you, you have to say they're tenacious. I would also say they're despicable because what they've done is uh, they poison the air that uh, Iraqi children breathe. Uh, they've uh, lit a bunch of oil fires that also poison the air. They've used vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices and detonated them in civilian areas. They've hid behind civilians. In a, it's just a cowardly tactic. They've driven millions of people from their homes and they've killed tens of thousands of people. Um, so really, um, while they are certainly, uh, you know, a, a very tough and adaptive enemy, really what they are is a despicable enemy with absolutely no legitimacy whatsoever using cowardly tactics. Okay, uh, Courtney Kibbe, I think you had a follow-up. Can I just um, ask you about Aleppo and Russia's, well, oh, the recent strikes in Aleppo in the last 24 to 48 hours. What's your assessment now that they've been going on for a while on who's conducting most of the strikes? Is it Russia or is it the Syrian regime? And what are, are, are the, the, um, the fighter jets that are flying off the Russian carrier, do you see them actually dropping anything in Aleppo? Um, and, and can you give us any sense of what, what they're, they're striking? You know what, Courtney, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to refer you to my esteemed colleagues in the Pentagon for that one. We're focused uh, strictly on the fight against Daesh, and um, those, all those issues are not really a part of our portfolio, although they're in Syria. Uh, that's, uh, there's not really a significant dash presence in Aleppo and all the things that you're asking about are, are just not things that we track day to day here uh, in, uh, in the uh, Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. Did the Russians give you a heads up that they were going to be firing any cruise missiles on the, in the deconfliction line or that they were going to be flying any new aircraft? Was there any discussion over that, about that? I'll have to circle back with you on that. I know we continue our deconfliction effort with the Russians. Um, that is an ongoing process. I'll have to check and we'll owe you that answer, Courtney. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Caroline, House Defense One. Hi, Hi Caroline. Go ahead. Um, hi. In the immediate week after um, the Kurdish allies announced the, their intent to advance, uh, begin advancing on Raqqa, we saw a quick ramp up of supporting strikes in, say, places like Ain Issa. Um, and now kind of a tapering off to a, maybe an average or a slightly above average pace. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, the pace of the advance and how, you, how long you expect it to continue and the, the support, um, U.S. support of it? Well, it'll be a deliberate plan. It's going to be conducted in phases. Uh, what I would say is that our, our uh, partners are exactly where they intended to be at the time they intended to be there. They've been able to move against the enemy uh, very effectively. They've encountered moderate resistance, uh, but they've been able to continue their advance. 
Uh, our strikes have been relatively consistent in that area, and we'll continue to do that. Certainly, we're going to take every opportunity we can to destroy DASH targets anywhere on the battlefield that they can be found. They should sleep with one eye open because we're not going to give them a moment's peace. Any time that we can remove danger from the battlefield, we'll do so. Uh, very similar uh, to the video we showed you uh, in Tel Afar. We're going to remove any dangerous capability that DASH has any time that we have a window of opportunity to do it. Can you, do you have any specific <clears throat> examples of the cap dangerous capabilities that, you have, that the strikes have been um, targeting in support of that advance? Well, what, uh, what we've encountered is uh, that Daesh, uh, in anticipation of the advance on Raqqa, they've created a significant number of fighting positions. They have uh, formations, groups of fighters uh, positioned in order to try and harass uh, the advance. And what we've done is we've taken every opportunity to remove those from the battlefield uh, with extreme prejudice. All right. Uh, Next, uh, go to Kasim. Uh, uh, you had a follow-up. Sorry. Uh, Colonel, I don't want to misreport you, so I want to make something very clear. Could you just clearly say whether there are YPG forces in Membich or not? Uh, I don't believe there are any. Um, my understanding is they were moving out. Thank you. And the other question, you said you characterized um, the suspension of air support to the Kurdish, sorry, Turkish-backed uh, forces in northwest Syria uh, as a, sig a significant signal for continuing diplomatic discussions that come how, about how the counter-ISIL uh, fight should be conducted in northwest Syria. I'm not sure I understand the question. Help me. You, you characterized uh, the, the suspension of airstrikes in support of the Turkish-backed forces in northern Syria as a signal for the continuing diplomatic discussions about how to, continue to, to uh, conduct the fight against ISIS in northwestern part, north, north part of Syria. Is we have, you know, that there are, for example, in northern, uh, northeastern Syria, there was also a discussion between Turkey and uh, United States and all other coalition partners whether you should continue to support YPG or not because of their controversial uh, separatist uh, ideologies and so on. And despite of all these discussions, the, the strikes in northeastern Syria continued. But when you come to the n northwest part of the Syria, the Syrian uh, territory, now you are putting some kind of condition saying that before we resume, the, dis the diplomatic discussion should, should come to a point. Could you s t tell us what is the condition uh, that would have you resume the airstrikes in northwestern Syria in support of the Turkish-backed forces? I think what you're asking about is the subject of ongoing uh, diplomatic discussions. It's beyond me, and I don't have uh, insight into what those discussions are. So I think we'll just have to let those discussions play out, and uh, that's really all there is to it. You're not aware of the condition that will have you resume the airstrikes in northwest Syria toward al bab or in support of the Turkish-backed forces. Is that why, why you say? Uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm a spokesman for military operations. This is a diplomatic issue that's a subject of ongoing discussion. I need to let the diplomatic side work that issue out. It's not my place to opine about it. Right, yeah, I want to follow up on your answer to my question on the um, uh, popular mobilization unit <coughs> in Tel Afar. You said the Iraqi army will be the force that enters the city. Is the Iraqi army prepared to do so in the near future or have difficulties with Mosul 
sort of slowed that down. My understanding is the Iraqis have adequate force in order to take Tal Afar as well. They'll do so on the timeline of their choosing. Uh, they're going to continue operations in Mosul. Um, we're not going to put a timeline on Tel Afar. So do you have a sense whether it's like two weeks or a month from now? You, do you have any idea? Uh, I do not, and if I did, I probably wouldn't uh, present it in a Pentagon press brief. I think I would let the Iraqi army uh, conduct their operations with operational security in mind. I'll need a valve to follow up. Hey, hey, Diggy, just, just so I can, we can close the loop on Manbij, or do you know if the YPG trainers are still there, as uh, McGurk suggested? Um, you seem to suggest that the YPG elements have left or are leaving. Are the trainers still there doing their training? You know what, I, I think I'd have to circle back with you. Um, my understanding is they are departing, uh, and they were doing that today. Uh, but uh, as far as whether every single one of them is gone, I think we, we you know, I, I, I would be uh, very uncomfortable saying every single one. I know that they plan to leave. I know that they were doing so. But um, I think we'd have to circle back with you if if you're asking for a granular, granular answer. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Tolga Tanis, any good yeah. follow-up? Colonel, just uh, the, to clarify the situation in Elbap, do you think that Turkish advance in Elbap is undermining the efforts to liberate Raqqa? Uh, I, I said nothing of the sort. I just said that we haven't supported that operation. And there are ongoing diplomatic discussions about the way forward uh, for how Raqqa will be retaken. Johnson had said to Wall Street Journal that Raqqa operation had hampered by the, the Jarablus operation when the Turks started in August to uh, clear the area from Daesh, the region, the, the border area. He had said to Wall Street Journal that uh, Raqqa operation had, uh, was hampered. Uh, so is this the implication, the same implication uh, that the basic concern of you stop this support to advance of Turkish military, is this the same concern that you have regarding Raqqa operation? Yeah, I haven't seen those reports and I really wouldn't want to comment on that. They're wrong. Yeah, uh, just a follow-up on the Man Beach situation. Can you just recall who is in charge now of the security uh, of, uh, in, in Man Beach? Who is in charge of the population in Man Beach? Uh, that would be the uh, Man Beach Military Council is in charge of maintaining the security there. And can you di just describe how its composition, for instance, uh, uh, who, who is, who is uh, manning this uh, council? You know what, I, uh, I think I'd have to owe you the answer on that with, uh, with the details. Kevin Barron, defense one. Katie, how are you? Uh, I'm going to have fun and ask you about Trump. <laughs> But actually, you know, about the transition, uh, with, with the presidential transition, have there been any requests from the Iraqi government uh, to meet with U.S. commanders to go over any kind of what comes next or concerns about the you know, incoming administration or questions? Is there, does anything like that happen with, with, the, with the, you know, the combined joint task force commanders of Townsend? Uh, I'm not of any, uh, aware of any such requests. Indeed, what I've seen is that everyone has remained focused on the task at hand, which is a very difficult, difficult fight to liberate Mosul. Uh, the Iraqis have stayed on that. It's the appropriate thing to stay on because it's a very tough fight, and it's going to take some time for us to get through that. 
All right, thanks. I'm sure you look forward to your first visit from the incoming commander in chief. Good luck. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, Colonel Dorian, we thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again soon. All right, thanks, Jeff.